Okay, hi everybody. Um, welcome to today's presentation. Um, thank you, Skirt, for um, having us to present today. Um, my name is Tan Nguyen, I'm the Business Development Manager for uh, Regal here in North America, uh, and also uh, the Regal California lead um, out in California. So we do have an office out in California, and I know uh, the scripts uh, we work with is also out in San Diego. So, um, and I know those guys over there, and hope they're uh, they're here. Um, yeah, so we'll get started. I have um, I have uh, some technical stuff on ladder technology. Um, what is ladder? The principle of ladder, uh, ladder systems and platforms, uh, regal laser measurement systems, uh, application for ladder technology, air, land, sea, um, and some data fusion. I just plugged this in at the last minute because uh, I've been pushing that this year, merging all those data sets together, right? So um, if you've done, if you've worked with ladder, uh, whether you work with a terrestrial system, or unmanned system, mobile system, Airborne system, you can merge all those data sets together and, and we want to come up with a workflow for that because uh, if you know Regal, we have a very robust portfolio. So uh, if you're an existing customer with one platform, if you want to get into another platform, uh, we can manage that data all within the same software suite and we do have a workflow for that. So it's really cool stuff. And just a little bit to show you on our new building and stuff. But yeah, let's talk. Um, Here's a little bit about us. Um, we are located um, in North American offices in um, Orlando, Florida, and our headquarters where all the manufacturers and developments, it's gonna be in Horn, right? Uh, so that's in Austria, just about 85 um, kilometer northwest of the Australian capital, Vienna. So uh, if you're ever in Horn, it's a very small uh, town. Uh, please come by and visit our headquarters. Um, but um, yeah, and then our distribution partners and representative were located all throughout the world. So uh, this technology is just not harnessed here. It's, it's being used all over the place. Um, it's been tested, it's been adapted, um, and it's been um, put through the, the, the weeds, right? So uh, we've been in business for over 40 years. Um, uh, we really build, try to exceed high quality systems, a high quality um, ladder systems, high, high quality ladder engine and accuracy and precision. Uh, you know, that's where we goes at. And, 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 and I know there's a lot of um, uh, manufacturers out there too as well, but we really try to stay within the scientific world um, of, of high quality, repeatability, longevity. Um, and then, of course, uh, customer service, because these systems, you know, they could be complex to use, uh, never, uh, but more so the data processing is also complex to as well. Um, exciting news, Regal, we are having our brand new headquarters built in Orlando. Uh, this is a 16,000 square foot facility that would do, um, uh, for existing customers out there, you'll love this, calibrations, um, um, systems repair, we're trying to keep that in North America, right? So in order to do all that, you gotta have a facility, you gotta have, you know, highly qualified employees. So, and this is what we're doing it for because to get these systems serviced, we gotta send it back to North America. So we gotta send it back to Austria and just the lag time on that's too long. It's not cost effective. So we've opened up our, um, our wallets and then we're building this brand new facility, which will um, take care of a lot of our customers requests as far as uh, support, repair, um, and then also, um, you know, training, sales, marketing, um, everything besides production, right? And we do do research here too as well. Um, this is actually our office. So I'll just gonna plug in a couple of scans that uh, some of my colleagues have done. Um, here looks at the foundation, some exterior walls and elevated shaft. Um, here we have um, the still beam structure uh, that goes up on it. And since we're using server control, we can match all the data set up together very, very well. Uh, and we've flown this, this site with our airborne scanner, unmanned scanner, drove it with a mobile scanner, and also a terrestrial, uh, terrestrial scanner. I won't show you too much about this because it's not what we're talking about today, but I have one more, a couple more slides to show you, and then we'll move on to some technical stuff. Uh, this is actually the site right here. Uh, this is an elevation view um, that shows it a heat map. And so zero is red, um, and then um, that's a meter change. Uh, so what is LiDAR? LiDAR or light detection and ranging is remote sensing technology that uses light in the form of a pulse laser to measure range, which is distance to a target, right? Um, so a LiDAR sensor fires off of uh, beams of photons, 
and then measures how long it takes to, for the time to return to the sensors. So that's the principle of it, right? So measuring light using time, right? So light is a constant speed, which is, um, you know, 180,000, uh, 180, um, um, 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, so light speed is constant. So we just take that um, and time, put a very high sophisticated timer inside the scanner and then wait for the pulse to come back and divide it by two and then um, calculate the distance that way. Uh, so here's a quick example of how um, we would measure it. So just imagine taking a bag of marbles and uh, you throw it at a wall and of course you have uh, deflections off the of surface, the contour of the surface, but of course not all the photons come back. So we measure what comes back and then that's the echo. Uh, and then we take that echo, we then compare it to the existing laser pulse and then that will give us uh, the time, but also way more information too as well. So it's not just, we're just not measuring time. Uh, we are, um, are measuring uh, 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 amplitude, intensity, reflectance. Uh, so there's a lot of information besides range that we get from these returns. And I'll show you all that um, here shortly. Um, so LiDAR technology, so, there's, so, so, so that's the principle of measuring uh, an object in space using um, laser beams, right? Uh, but beyond that, the technology itself does divide a little bit, okay? Um, so it's not just one methodology. There's different method to, to analyze the wave um, coming back. So there's really two types that we really talk about here is one is called um, pulse time of flight. Well, which is which is what Regal uh, specializes in, and has um, some um, patents that 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 really makes our data quality stands out. Um, that, that really changes the quality of the data, right? Uh, and then there's a phase-based lidar, which which then measures the um, the 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 angle of the laser and I'll, I'll get into that just a little bit here. Uh, but with time of flight, we can take it down a little bit further, right? We can take that um, analog signal, we can digitize it uh, and then we can analyze more information from it, um, getting multiple returns um, versus discrete returns, right? So discrete returns is, 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 is it still exists. Um, so the discrete returns only analyzes one way, uh, one, one echo uh, at a time, uh, which we do too, but we analyze multiple echoes within a single laser uh, beam, right? Versus the discrete return, they only analyze one echo within a laser beam versus um, using time of flight and then digitizing uh, the echo. We can analyze multiple returns within a um, single laser beam, which is advantageous and is beneficial um, for uh, measuring vegetation and through vegetation, right? Um, but with 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 um, with uh, with uh, uh, digitizing the analog signal, uh, the echo, uh, we can process the data in two different ways: um, either offline or online. Uh, we won't get into the much of the weeds about that, but the whole principle behind that is that offline is post processing, and then online is real time um, processing. So we use a, um, um, and, and I'll tell you in a minute, and, and ultimately uh, by digitizing our waveform, we can then get a very precise, accurate, and a very rich attribute uh, point cloud. Um, so time of flight's at the bottom and phase shift's at the, uh, sorry, time of flight's at the top, phase shift's at the bottom. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, we specialize in time of flight. Um, uh, because it has a lot of advantages, right? And it has a lot of uh, characteristics that we can benefit from uh, by using time of flight. So um, it's a single laser source. So we use single laser um, at, at a time. Of course, we can fire at super high uh, rate, um, you know, anywhere in the uh, two megahertz range, right? So that's super high uh, pulse rate. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's simple. It's got a transmitter receiver. Um, and the clocking mechanism that times the beams when it hits an object and comes back, 
you know. Uh, but time of flight is what we're going to be looking into uh, for the rest of this presentation. Uh, so the principle of time of flight um, it takes a measurement for a light pulse to travel to target back. Time of flight devices capture data at a rate between hundreds of thousands of points per second. Uh, and now, you know, with more robust systems, we're in collecting millions of points per second. Um, but you can, you can say, yeah, a system can collect millions of points, but you also have to look at the field of view too as well. Because uh, when the mirror rotates towards the back of the housing, those returns are lost. And let's just say if a system capture um, data at a million points per second, well, that's countable for 360 degrees. So if your field of view is only, let's say, 100, uh, 100 field of degrees field of view, you're only capturing 75 to 50,000, uh, sorry, 500,000 measurement points per second, right? So you don't really capture all the points that the, the system's rated for. You only capture within the field of view of the scanner. Um, using time of flight, we can make it an eye safe laser. Um, uh, we can uh, do very high pulse rate, uh, pulse dial transmitter, and, and sensitive narrow uh, band optical receiver, which then um, that's really how we can um, pinpoint where the return is. Um, so that will ultimately increase our precision and accuracy and filter out uh, using pulse shift deviation. And the advantage is it's highly reliable, um, it's quick data acquisition, highly uh, color made measurement beam. Um, excellent cost to performance ratio. Uh, it's compact and we can shoot really long range with it. So there's some big benefits to using time of flight versus uh, phase based, right? So if you want to select a system, you know, make sure you what your applications are, um, then you should then do your research and select the right one. Um, uh, just a couple of minutes. In my, uh, Previous slide, I talked about uh, discrete return system, multiple return systems. Um, with Regal now, all of our V-line scanners, VQ scanners, uh, we all use multiple returns capabilities, right? So that should be like this industry standard now is, is, is having a laser scanner that has multiple returns, which ultimately is a big benefit when we're surveying and capturing data in an environment that has vegetation. Um, so when the laser beam travels to an object, um, of course, with a multiple returns capability, we can then uh, capture all the returns or most of the returns or some of the returns within the vegetation uh, so that we can penetrate and get the surface behind all the vegetation, which uh, most likely is gonna be uh, our ground, and that's what we want, right? So we ultimately we want to scan from above, um, or scanning in these um, topographic surveys. We want ground. Um, yeah. So, so all of our scanners have multiple returns capability, and you can have it to unlimited, which is full waveform processing, or um, online waveform processing, which then limits you to to a certain amount of returns. It's because our, uh, the computer inside a scanner um, cannot compare the outgoing wave to the incoming, uh, incoming echo at the rate that the scanner is firing, right? So that's a big issue too as well for online waveform because you're limited to the, how many returns you get back. I believe on our highest online waveform processor, I think we can get up to 16 returns um, for every single laser pulse, which is pretty good, uh, which is really good. Um, of course, then versus multiple versus unlimited return systems are most likely going to be your airborne systems, right? So a lot of your airborne system, a lot of your high speed pro, uh, high speed mobile system, they're mostly going to have unlimited returns. But even so, you're still capped off unless you know um, uh, you want to just log all the data and then post process it later. Um, because we don't have a computer inside the scanner that can process all the data in real time. Um, so, um, Regal Full Waveform Processing, um, which takes this as analog signal and using a, uh, again, full waveform, the message here is uh, post processing, unlimited returns, right? Um, where we take all, we take all the um, analog signal and then we digitize it later using a Gaussian Deschamps composition. Uh, bell-shaped curve um, 
a mathematical equation. Uh, why we do this? Because it's robust, it's fast. Uh, pulse width attribute, that's what's very important. The pulse width attribute is extremely important because that would then tell us uh, out the deviation of every single return. So, and we'll look at that a little bit later and we'll look at how it will apply to you. And if you have one of our Google system, I'll, uh, I, I, this is not a presentation where I show you the detail on how to apply it, but I'll show you what to look for when to apply it. Um, and then of course it's post-processing. Uh, so that's, so that's, so this is full waveform where we uh, log all the signal and then we uh, assign it and attributes afterwards uh, using a Gaussian D shunt composition bell shaped curve mathematical equation. Yeah. Uh, but then we get into online waveform processing. Now, this is all of, in our VZ lines, our terrestrial scanners. Um, I think the highest one is 16 returns and the lowest part is four returns. Um, this is a real time processing. This is amazing stuff because you can collect data and see it in real time um, or near real time. Sorry, not real time, near real time. Um, so we use a system response fitting, also a Gaussian decomposition. So we have a library of all these um, pole shape. Um, and then as we're getting the echo, we're comparing our library to it and whatever fits the best, uh, we assign an attribute and a value to it. So that's, that's the big difference between online waveform versus um, full waveform. And it's still using a Gaussian decomposition um, mathematical equation to do that. Uh, you see at the bottom on my third bullet point is 6 million echoes per second. That's what limits us to versus all the return. So the return has to meet in certain uh, limitations, certain attributes and reflectance. Um, uh, sorry, certain ant intensity and reflectance in order for us to accept that and use it against our library, right? So if the points it's doesn't match within our limitation, of course, we don't keep it. And we just keep the four returns that meets our uh, attributes uh, closest. Um, go. Okay. Uh, pole shape deviation. So the similarity of echoes, uh, pulse uh, to instrument specific reference pulse, right? So we take the pulse that we send out, uh, then we take the incoming pulse, and then we compare it to, we fit it, best fit, um, and then we spit it out, and we call that pole shape deviation. Uh, this is extremely advantageous to have uh, within your arsenal of processing tools. Um, it's because we can filter out a lot of noise, um, a lot of um, points that has a high uncertainty and a high deviation. And I, I think all of our software packages should have this tool. Uh, I know our threshold scanner, sorry, the threshold uh, package does, um, but our terrestrial uh, mobile uh, package also should have two as well. So we call this pole shape deviation. It's a very uh, <coughs> neat way to analyze it's because we can, because we log everything. That's why. And we just compare it. Um, so, so here's an example of a tree uh, that we scanned if, if, uh, to, to the naked eye. The tree looks very pretty. Uh, it's a good looking tree. Um, but to the trained eye, it would be zooming a little bit closer. You can see uh, there are lines that are coming off of the branches, right? Um, so by using that, um, and that's from the multiple returns, by the way, um, that's from the length of the wave, the, 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 the distance between the objects that are how close to each other, uh, you're gonna get points, and we call it ambiguous returns between two objects, right? Because the objects are too close together. I think they're closer than 40 centimeter, um, and, and it's from results uh, of the, um, multiple returns and then objects being too close together okay but nevertheless by applying uh, a deviation filter and maybe even a reflectance filter uh, we can certainly get rid of um, all those returns and then really uh, get a point cloud that can identify our objects very very accurately very precisely um, and very clean okay uh, here and, and also by a lot, by having this type of filtering it allows us to scan in adverse conditions, right? So here you have an instrument that's scanned. We scanned it in the rain. This is specifically for this testing. Um, so, we, so we know all the attributes of every single points. And, and by using certain attributes such as deviation and um, reflectance, uh, we can then set certain values. So if you're using terrestrial scanner out there, 
um, here's some values I can throw for you and, 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 and for rain, right? Uh, so there's different values for snow, uh, for dust. Um, and, and with this type of multiple returns capability, you, that's the only way you're going to be able to scan out in adverse condition. Now, I'm not saying go out there and scan when it's pouring down, you know, category, whatever, hurricane. Um, but you can still scan in, in these adverse conditions, you know, snow, dust, uh, fog. Um, and, and, and by having the multiple returns capability, you can really penetrate all the particles and drops that are uh, lingering in the air and still be able to uh, capture the objects behind you. So you can see down there, our camp positions are uh, located outside in the rain. And then by simply applying this filter, we can certainly um, make good use of the data still and also acquire data out in search adverse conditions, right? Um, so regular full waveform processing, um, uh, there's a couple things I wanna talk about here is amplitude and then reflectance, right? So amplitude is the peak threshold. Uh, it's the parameters of A, B, and C on this graph. And it's the peak threshold of a laser pulse return, right? So, and this peak threshold uh, differs uh, depending on range. So it's range dependent, but we still calibrate it though. So that makes sure that arranging is accurate. Um, so we use all these attributes to, to make sure that the, 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 the ranging error is, is, is very low. So uh, but with amplitude, it's range dependent. So for example, if you're scanning a rock surface at one meter, uh, it has a certain amplitude value. If you move back at 30 meter, the amplitude value is different, right? Which is expected because uh, light gets, will lose energy over distance, right? Um, so by knowing this value, we're able to do something very special is do a calibrated reflectance, okay? Um, so now when we scan the same surface, um, it's advantageous to know that the dB value is going to be constant, right? So if you're scanning a riverbank or um, if you're in a mine condition where you're, where you're in oil and gas, where you got to scan a high wall to see if there's any pay dirt. Well, you can scan a different position away from the wall, away from the surface, and still get that same reflectance value. And of course, you're limited to only a certain um, degree of field of view, right? So within 100 degrees, I think anything outside of uh, plus or minus 30 degrees, um, the amplitude is, is, it loses its calibration. So it's within a small window. Uh, but we could filter that out too as well. Yeah, so reflectance, we have a very special reflectance. And, and here's what I mean by that, is that here's a picture of a scan and you can see low is blue. You can see the blue objects that are further away uh, versus the red objects that are closer to the scanner is because as I mentioned in my last slide, the further you made from the object, you lose the intensity and the amplitude of the light. Well, by calibrating it, we can then get a more um, uniform and homogenized um, values throughout our point cloud, right? And that's, that's a big advantage um, when we're looking at these surfaces, um, especially in a scientific um, world and, and um, for research, um, you want to know the consistency of the surface throughout range. So, um, yeah, so that's what we have here is the calibrated reflectance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, there's a lot of attributes within the, every single point. So it's, it's well beyond the X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and here I'll show you what I'm talking about, um, all the attributes that you can really extract. And, and I'll just play them all right now. Yeah, so, so you have RGB, you have your deviation waveform. You have your reflectance, you have your tar um, uh, multiple targets, uh, you have your amplitude, and of course, X, Y, and Z. And if you want to add R, um, IR to it, you can certainly make use of um, infrared. And we do have infrared cameras uh, for external integration with, um, I would say, all of our scanner systems, at least. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of information inside the point cloud just beyond the X, Y, and Z. Uh, here's a perfect example, right? So on the left, um, it's not a photo, by the way. That's actually, I think it's a, it might be a photo. 
I thought it was a scan. I just positioned it very well so it looks realistic. Um, so yeah, on the left, you have your photogrammetry image. Uh, of course, um, photogrammetry are passive sensors. So it depends on um, light to capture um, the information uh, versus LIDAR um, or active sensors. So for example, um, you can scan in pitch dark because the light source is the laser. You don't need light, right? Uh, but it's beyond that. It can penetrate such surfaces such as paint. So if you were to look at the wall that the rails are on, you can see on your left-hand side, you don't see the beautiful artwork. Um, but on the right-hand side, you know, by switching it to a reflectance value, you could then see, um, you know, surfaces right in the uh, artwork behind the paint. Um, so in this case, I see this a lot when we're scanning bridges and stuff. Um, it's because you just need to put more paint over that surface. So they're, they're lacking a little bit of paint. But of course, it is, it's not shown to the naked eye, right? Um, but we can certainly see it on a laser scanning system. Yeah, because, you know, the contrast between the painted area versus the non-graffiti area, uh, it's darker or, or reflects differently versus the area that didn't have a new graffiti. And it's just as simple as that, right? So you just, if you put Tim or coats over that, maybe... Um, you won't see with the laser, but yeah, no, you can't. Um, yeah, so ladder platforms. So there's a lot of different ladder platforms out there, and they're not made one for all. Um, you know, I know a lot of researcher and universities that have multiple systems and multiple platforms, uh, terrestrial platforms, mobile platforms, airborne platforms, and UAV platforms. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and take a quick video. Um, of, of th there's different platforms that are available. I have a question that, um, can you see the corrosion underneath the paint? Um, I'm not yeah. seeing any, any video there, Tan. Yeah, I didn't see some either. Um, I'll try it again, but I have a question here. Um, can you see the corrosion under, uh, under paint? Yeah, you can. I have seen it, um, especially on bridges, on steel bridges. Um, I have some customers that have given me point cloud data uh, to look at. And I, so you have to be able to adjust your uh, minimum and your maximum dB value properly in order to make um, the corrosions come about or uh, the paint uh, through the, the graffiti through the paint. So yeah, it is possible to see corrosion under paint and rust, uh, whatever the case is too as well. Uh, I'll try the video one more time, but it, it's a 90 second video. If it doesn't work, then we'll just move on. Um, sometime these um, platforms have some problems with video, so and maybe I have it now. So yeah, it's just a it's just a ninety second video of showing different platforms, surveying, and different uh, type of um, conditions. So um, I'll try one more time. Somebody said I should be able to share the video, but um, let me see. Maybe I just gotta press some. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, um, if you want the video, I'll make it available. Uh, so there are a lot of different type of systems and um, engines out there, right? So it's not just from us. It's, 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 all, it's, it's a lot of manufacturers out there that, that, that has. But we do have a very um, comprehensive portfolio, um, very robust portfolio. So you have to look at scanner systems, and then you have to think about scanner engines, right? So there's a difference between the two. Uh, so, for example, at the top left, the terrestrial systems, right? So it's complete turnkey. It's got its own computer. Uh, it's got its own laser source, its own processor. Uh, it's, you, put, you put power to it, and you're ready to scan. Uh, but if you go right below that, um, you have a lot of engines. So that is a simple 2D laser scanner um, that requires external integration to make it work. 
And when I say make it work, I don't mean turn it on, but to make it usable, right? So three important components on a LiDAR engine that you need it to work. Most likely it's gonna be a kinematic system, right? The LiDAR engines are most likely gonna be a kinematic system. So what that means is that you gotta have an IMU, um, you gotta have GPS, and then you gotta have um, pros processing. Um, besides the laser itself, right? So you gotta have those three components to make it work. Uh, when I say processing is really processing the trajectory, that's the, I think that's a very key component uh, when dealing with kinematic um, scanning. Right? Uh, and then you have to the right, um, to the middle, and then right above that, you have some uh, industrial scanners. So for monitoring, uh, for the researcher, we, um, Right below here, you'll see laser scanners for LS. We have a system that's mounted uh, with one of our customers and partner in Greenland right now. Uh, that's been sitting there for a very long time, a couple of years, monitoring the, uh, the ice sheets that's flowing in and out of one of um, the waterways, I guess. Um, and it's just sitting there collecting data for the last couple of years. Uh, of course, we send somebody out there once in a while to check on it. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's for long range monitoring. Uh, then you have your mobile system, right? So this is for mainly um, for modeling cities and highways. Right? So um, a lot of time, if you're on a big scale um, topographic mapping mission, you know, you're probably going to want to fly it, right? Because uh, to have a mobile mapper, you got to have a vehicle that can drive it there. So it's it's, it's convenient for 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 um, silvo and infrastructure and stuff, but uh, not so much for ur non-urban rural area scanning. Uh, and then the top right, we have our unmanned system. So this is becoming quite popular in the uh, drone world. Uh, we have a handful of different unmanned system. Um, it's because of weight weight limitation so we got to build them small we, you know we build them too small you can't build them as fast when you, you build them too small you can't build them as accurate so we got to have different platforms for a different um unmanned system but you'll you'll see a couple a little bit later and then of course you have your big boys slider systems for bathymetry and also airborne scanning so this is for large scale mapping this is for wide area mapping high altitude mapping um so yeah, so you're looking at our simple config, uh, simple spread of our uh, ladder systems and ladder engines. And of course, Regal take care and builds them, every single one of them all in-house and in software too as well. Um, uh, so to look at some of our um, airborne systems, right? So these are some of our newer systems that uh, we've recently released. Um, of course, different systems call for different platforms. Um, you wouldn't want to put a VUX 1LR on a Cessna, it just wouldn't make any sense. Um, uh, but you could, you know, find a, 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 a um, an unmanned system that's that's robust enough and has the payload um, that you could certainly use it for. Um, and then you have some new sensors, the two in the middle, or some um, kind of like hybrid sensors, right? Uh, I have seen these things on very big unmanned system, but they also work in helicopters too as well. So, you know, um, the first three from the bottom up, they're kind of like hybrid systems. So the very, very interesting systems to, to use uh, for cross platforms, right? Um, and with the pulse rate, with the range of capability, um, ultimately what we want to do here is fly higher, fly, fly faster and have more points on the ground. And still maintain that high accuracy and precision, right? Um, so with airborne systems, you get a lot of good information, right? And when I say a lot, because it's wide area mapping, I don't say a lot of information is, uh, because you, you can cover a large area. Um, and with that multiple returns capability that we talked earlier, uh, we can really make good use of the data. Um, we can process it and then take it all the way down to a terrain model, as you can see here, a DTM or we can um, uh, categorize and uh, index the vegetation and, and um, you can detect changes for canopy growth, uh, vegetation growth over time. 
Um, so yeah, so a lot of information that you can, you can really extract uh, from this point cloud, um, flying from the air, ground, or unmanned, or mobile, or terrestrial scanning. So uh, rich layers of information, that's the message here by using um, full waveform digitization um, and also online waveform processing. Um, these are the two hybrid systems that I really like um, for the for the Regal family. Uh, and the first one is the green laser. Yeah, so these are our uh, our, um, our uh, bathymetry solution. Um, please note these scanners don't scan underwater. Okay, they fly from above and penetrate the water. Um, it's got a compact and it's flexible to different platforms. I think that's an advantage. Uh, so, you know, whether you're, you're, you want to use a system on an airplane, you can also use it on a helicopter or a very robust um, unmanned system too as well. Yeah, it's got a high pulse rate and also um, long range capability too as well. Um, we, I've seen some tests done here in Florida uh, on some of our systems and we were able to achieve I don't think down to about, it's, it's a shallow water mapper, right? So we're not talking about, you know, deep ocean and things. So a shoreline mapping, um, I think I've seen data up to about 20 feet or, or more, a little bit more. So, and it really all, all depend on the psychic depth. Um, and also a lot of little variables like water cl um, clarity and uh, turbidity of the water. Um, so a psychic depth is, is a dis, which has a black and white um, offset pattern, um, two black, two whites. And uh, when you drop it down, um, as soon as you lose sight of it, you, that's calculates the second depth, right? So that's, that's the easy um, definition of that. Um, but yeah, so it all really depends on the water uh, condition um, to really uh, put a number and a value um, on how, Deep these systems can penetrate. Yeah, so here's a sample data set uh, from a helicopter. Um, fly altitude is about 75 to 100 meters, 250 meters. Point density is 50 points per square meter, and a cheap depth is three meters. So yeah, like I said, it's it's in the second depth of 1.4 meter, right? Uh, so it's a shallow water uh, system. Uh, but these systems are when I say hybrid, and I, and I do mean hybrid in a in um in a form that. It's also a topographic mapper too as well. So not only it can penetrate water to a certain degree um, to achieve the seabed or water surface, subsurf subsurface um, object, it can also get topographic stuff too, like vegetation and stuff too as well. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a big advantage um, to map shallow water and also topographic surveys. Um, here's our newest unmanned system. This has been a very um, extremely complement to our um, unmanned system. Uh, what's unique about the Mini VUX series is that it's we have a complete turnkey plug and play uh, for the DJI M600 model off the shelf. Um, drone platform right so it's light with the new one it's got 200 kilohertz which is extremely fast uh, and this is full uh, online waveform processing time of flight technology um, you can also marry it with rgb ir and different selection of imus because that's important to know is that you can put different imus on here because ultimately that will uh, on a good versus a bad IMU, or no, not so um, a high end IMU versus a lower end IMU. That's night and day difference in the quality of the point cloud, the quality of the noise, um, and the accuracy and the precision of the points. But with the new release of the Mini VUX to um, to a UAV, uh, we've been seeing significant. Um, we can fly. Uh, you can fly faster. You can go higher. Um, you can also get ultimately more points on the ground. And that also helps with the um, multiple paths, right? So when you fly an area, you got to fly in different patterns. And you got to fly it over twice almost. Uh, unless you have different application where, you know, you don't need that point density. But typically, if you want the point density, you're going to have to do basket weave or 
uh, whatever pattern you want to choose multiple times. And with the multiple points on the ground, or sorry, with more points on the ground, double the points, uh, you're going to have your, um, your registration from one path to another is, is going to be much better um, because you have more points to work with. That's all. Okay. Um, and of course, here is the ultimate solution uh, is the Regal Rycopter. So this Rycopter is made to handle an extremely heavy payload. Of course, you know, you have your controller, you have your options of the IMU, you have your option of different cameras. Of course, our standard options are two Sony Alpha cameras. And then more importantly, you have your option of different sensors too as well. So um, you're gonna be able to um, uh, use uh, the bigger sensors that I showed you earlier, the hybrid sensors, and then also the mini sensors and also the, um, the VUX 1HA, which is, um, I think is our go-to sensor, is the same sensor, that, uh, VUX 2HA is the same sensor that's on the, um, our mobile system. And also the LR, which is extended long range uh, VUX, okay? Um, yeah, so here is a data fusion data set um, that I got my hands on. I've done a couple myself, um, but yeah, here you have a really complete scene of um, all the data from above and from the ground when you merge it together, if you have that capability, uh, you really get a complete scene. Because sometimes when you're scanning from the top, you don't get all the contour of the land, of the ground, or you may not get enough points on the ground, uh, versus when you scan from the ground, you get all the points on the ground on the, on, on the topo, but you don't get the top of the canopy. So by using multiple systems and multiple platforms and doing merging, data merging, data fusion, you really get a complete uh, scene of the area you're surveying. Um, and then talk about some of our terrestrial scanners. So we've had a long line of terrestrial scanners and our, this is our old Z class series, sorry, our VZ series. Um, all the way to the right, I'll show you a little bit more information about that later. I find that one's very unique. Uh, it can think it shoots up to 6,000 meters and still maintain an accuracy of, you know, 15 millimeter or one centimeter. So, uh, of course, it's a class B3 laser, so you just got to wear your safety gear. Um, but moving on, just from that, uh, we have a the I-series, right? And the reason why I choose to show you guys the I-series is because it's saturated with technology. And this technology goes a long way um, when we're analyzing the data. So the LiDAR engine itself, you know, of course, we utilize our online waveform processing, also option for full waveform, which just logs all the returns and then you just have to analyze it later with our, using our library and SDK. Um, uh, dig, dig, digitized echo, uh, data, data structure, uh, storage and, inter and interfacing, uh, integrated RGB camera, and also option for IR cameras, uh, GNSS receiver L1, option for L2, and also option for external and RTK receivers, uh, like an R8 or trim R8, R10. Um, a pause estimator that does the tilt, the heading, uh, and it's auto leveling itself in a barometric sensors as well. So all this information, sorry, all this technology integrated internally and also externally allows us to really acquire data uh, at a fast rate uh, and also process data at a fast rate because the i-series scanner now has two uh, computers in it. One computer is dedicated for the ranging and the LiDAR system, uh, the LiDAR engine. And then the other computer is made for post-processing. Here's the cool thing about this is that it has a user interface that allows our customers and users to develop their own apps using Python scripting. Yeah? So what that means is that when we're collecting data, the other uh, processor, which has a high-speed processor, can filter out data, can register data, can colorize data, uh, can, you know, yeah, it can do a number of processing capability um, with the other online processor. 
Uh, on top of that, its connectivity is 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 is, is far more advanced than I would ever picture a scanner would be in terms of getting it online. So this thing, the scanner has um, onboard slot for a SIM card. Uh, right now, we're working with Verizon only. Uh, that's cable from North America. Um, also has um, Bluetooth um, and then Wi-Fi. Um, so yeah, with all that, I can create a, a GNSS file, load it onto the scanner, and then just by using the L1 receiver, I can I can go out and get this put the scanner online, whether through a SIM card or tethering Bluetooth. Sorry, yeah, tethering. Um, I can get correct RTK correction from your from the from from the localized. Um, uh, VRS provider. So most states have that. Florida certainly does. It's free. So anytime I scan online, uh, sorry, anytime I scan outside, I make sure the scanner is online. Um, I can then always collect with R2K accuracy. On top of that, we can also make use of the cloud connectivity. So as you're scanning out in the field, we can set it up so that it can then connect to a FTP server or a cloud server like Amazon or Microsoft, um, or even a NAS drive, which is the ultimate security out of those three. Um, yeah, so it's got a lot of capabilities and, and it's a quick scanner. The, the newest upgrade, which is I think it's last year to this, and I think it's a huge advantage to speed wise. The images are taken at the, taken at the same time as the um, data acquisition, right? So, as as you may, those out there that have used terrestrial scanners before, we all know that it scans, and then it stops, and then it takes images. Okay, so that's two passes. That's going to take time. With this, um, it takes images at the same time. So, depending on your angle of overlap. Oh, sorry, yeah, the degrees of overlap, uh, it will take images at the exact same time as it's scanning. Of course, there's limitations to the shutter speed and the scan speed that you're working out, but it's not a problem um, that we've ran into uh, just yet. Uh, and then of course, there are vehicle mounted mounts for TLS. So here you can see um, to get a scanner at a certain position, especially threshold scanning, the higher you go, the better angle of incidence you're going to have on horizontal surfaces, right? So that's the physics part about it, because if the angle is too shallow, your horizontal return is limited to its ranging capability. Because at certain distance, um, at certain height, for example, at tripod height, uh, anything beyond, let's just say 100 feet, um, your return your return beam echo, it's no longer a, cir a circular pattern. It's more of an ellipsoid. So uh, the deviation is gonna be extremely high. It's gonna be extremely noisy. So by having an L scanner elevated, um, you can now increase the range on your horizontal surfaces, your topographic survey. So this is, this is a, a great setup um, for doing um, forestry work. You know, when you have low canopy, um, you're really gonna take advantage of the scanner's range of capability by having the scanner on up. And it's with every single scanner out there. It's not just uh, these scanners that you're looking at. Um, you know, you put any scanner on the tripod, you're gonna lose the range. But if you have it elevated like this, you're definitely gonna increase the range. It's a big difference. Um, yeah, and you can put it on different type of um, vehicles too as well. So it's not just dedicated for this beautiful truck right here. You know, you put on ATV or even a golf cart too if you want it. And you can lift it up as high as you want. It goes in different levels and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, here's a cool video that I always like to show in the uh, science community. Um, and of course, it's not gonna play, but I, let me see if you just give me one sec. It's not playing on my PowerPoint. It, it, it has earlier, um, but I think this team platform has limited my 
video capability for today. But if you just give me one moment, um, and this video gives you a demonstration of the technology that I was talking about. Let's see. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So this is a terrestrial scanner. Um, this is in Hawaii. Um, that's from an IR camera. So this is a lava lake at the bottom. So I guess they're detecting the height and of the lava lake, how high it is above. Um, so you can see all the, um, the steam or the smoke from this volcano, right? Um, of course, you're never gonna be able to measure any, anything down there. I mean, but by having an active sensors, you know, we can really take advantage of this technology and, 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 and that's the lava down there of the cavity, right? I'll mute the music. Um, yeah, it's a very cool stuff. And, and using in a different type of scanning method, like monitoring, uh, we can program the scanners to scan back and forth at certain rate and certain time. Um, and by doing that, you see here it has an RTK right on top for uh, positioning. Um, you can quantify the changes in height in this scenario, you can see that there's a difference of over a meter um, in changes over time. So this is this is the lava oozing out of one of the tubes um, as they were scanning on the island, okay? And of course, we'll switch it over to a, um, a little bit colder region. I was fast forward because I think I'm running out of time. And you can see, um, yep, we're, we, we can set it up and then just let it scan over time, a long period of time, and then really quantify um, how much moving of glacier and ice sheets that's coming out of these channels. Okay, so very cool stuff. Okay, all right. Um, so here's some 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 examples of the quality that you get from from these type of systems. Um, it's because behind the scene we've done a lot of um, math and, and 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 research and and effort to put into the system to get this type of quality. What you're looking at is a point cloud. This is a black beach in California. I think some of you guys might know where this place is at. Beautiful location. Um, so I scanned it. And you can see right here, um, this area might be a little bit of danger because um, this rock could be coming off the cliff anytime. I don't know, but that's what it looks like to me. Uh, but using different attributes, like for example, reflectance, we can really see different quality inside the point cloud, right? So that was RGB. Um, and then this is just putting a different scale to it. This is an x-ray view. Um, and this is just from a different angle. So uh, this is an elevation view, really quick to do. Uh, you can see there's a change of about a, a meter from the blue to the red. Um, you know, really cool stuff. This is inside the, the Mink River in New Hampshire um, where they were monitoring. Now, this was just a training class for Dartmouth uh, University or college, Dartmouth College, yeah. Here's an extra review of it. Um, so earlier when I, when I mentioned the, the multiple returns capability, this area has very high uh, vegetation. 
Um, but there are filters out there that are very sophisticated that can remove this vegetation and really give you a DTM. Um, so if, yeah, if you guys want to know a lot more about that, let me know if you're, if you're doing forestry um, and you need to remove the ground and quantify the vegetation or vice versa. Um, and if you're using, you know, regal product, obviously, let me know and I will help you out for sure. Um, here's some long wing scanning that um, we've done in the past. You can see here, it's out at 6,222 meters. Uh, but zoom in a little bit closer, um, we can, we can do just a quick um, survey of that little area. And you can still see at such range, we're still maintaining um, a high accuracy. And this is not on a flat surface. This is rock. This is out in um, Nevada somewhere. Um, so have a deviation uh, amongst 140 points. I, I'm, we're still achieving a deviation of um, 1.5 centimeter. Um, here's a setup for uh, slope, uh, slope stability. Mm, you can see um, the project was then compared to a total station. Um, so yeah, with this, you know, uh, this type of technology, uh, ranging capability is, 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 is a very big advantage um, for these type of survey and scientific search, uh, research and stuff too. And especially for avalanche. So I don't know if it's, it's, you guys are doing avalanche out in Colorado, but and we have some customers that are doing some avalanche that are using our scanners to, 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 to look at the slopes angle so that they can blast it or, you know, uh, wait you know, to blast it so that it can cause avalanche. Um, yes. Okay. All right. And we're almost done here. So here's some of the last slides. So we have some new voxel tools. Uh, this is also for slopes comparison. You can see over time, uh, this slope is failing. As it fails, we can trigger an alarm so that it doesn't hurt anybody, okay? That's very cool stuff. And here is a data fusion of all platforms that we own. So Aqua's ALS, Airborne, Yellow's TLS, Terrestrial, Lima's MLS is mobile, Blue is ULS, Unmanned. So I do a cross section here. You can see the data has different noise level. That's absolutely true. But nevertheless, all the points are completely homogenized together. So uh, in that case, um, let me know what other presentations you want me to do next time. Uh, I, I want to talk more to you about it to, in this community. Um, we can get more technical or we can, you know, look at some more fun stuff. But uh, thank you for your attention. And um, if you want to reach out to me directly, feel free to. I think uh, my information is posted somewhere. If not, uh, I'll make sure that it does. Thank you, everybody. So, Thank you, Tan. Appreciate your uh, uh, coming out today and uh, giving this presentation. And uh, um, just going to leave off with um, everyone knowing that uh, if there is something that you want to see in the future um, regarding the Scripps Technical Forum, please do reach out to uh, Gwen, Vanessa, or myself, and we can set you up with uh, um, whatever it is, you know, if you've got an outside vendor or there's someone on campus that you really feel um, has something to add to our community, please let us know and we'll, we'll get a presentation set it up. And with that, I'll um, say good afternoon to you all. <laughs>